My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence. My goal is to explore the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. In addition to leadership, I like to discuss mental health, PTSD, and overcoming adversity. If you have a favorite episode, I would love to hear about it. Message me through social media or my website, and I will share some free tools to help you achieve your goals. Please like, subscribe, and leave a review. If you haven't purchased your copy of my book, Fireproof, please grab a copy today. Thanks for listening. Today, I'm speaking with William Sturgeon. I'll be referring to him as Bill or Chief throughout this conversation. Uh, he was a chief officer at the fire department I retired from, spent roughly 30 years in the fire service, uh, ultimately leading to the, the culmination of his career being a fire chief of a, a fire department here in Central Florida, uh, ended up transitioning to become the city manager of that, that city. And now, uh, Chief, you're doing consulting work. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to share the name of the company or I if you'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Fitch and Associates. All right. And, and what does that company do? So, so Fitch and Associates is a, a subsidiary of uh, MedServe and also the Emprise Group. And there's, there's several aspects of the company. First of all, we do a lot of management contracts. We actually um, provide management services for over a million calls a year of ambulance services across the company. So we actually do contracts for CEOs and managers of ambulance services. And then there's the consulting side of the house, which we have that divided into two divisions, which is the EMS division and the fire division, which I work in. And also we run uh, Life Flight Eagle, which is the Missouri State Helicopter Program. So been around about 35 years. Jay Fitch started the founding partner of the company. And um, I came on about a year ago with Dr. Steve Knight, who I went to executive fire officer program with, and we work on the fire side of the house. Uh, a lot of commingling with EMS, obviously, with fire-based EMS. So we work together with that side of the house, too. Well, I always like to get a sense for the, you know, the person's background that I'm interviewing. And I know a little bit about you because we've known each other for years. But for the audience, um, where did, you know, where were you born and raised? And uh, what were some of your early influences that maybe led you towards the fire service? Yeah, I think I think it's a great question, Dave. And again, thank you for having me today. Um, I was born in Newburgh, North Carolina. Uh, my father was a uh, engineer for Lockheed Martin, and my mother's a school teacher. She spent 38 years in the classroom. I always tell people that's where I got the heart of a teacher. Um, got some of my dad's logic as an engineer. I'm not a great mathematician. Other than statistics, I could sell those to you all day long, as long as I know they're correct. Um, my, my growing up was very interesting. I actually lived overseas. I lived in Thailand. I lived in Iran. So I consider myself very cultured. I've lived in different cultures all over around the world, but home base was always in Lake County, Florida. And that's significant because I, uh, there was a fire across the street from my house when I was about 14 years old and the Mount Clement fire volunteer fire company started right after that fire. And they actually ended up getting an old pump a sewer truck and put a 60 gallon per minute pump on the back. And, um, you know, I wasn't old enough to be a, a, a firefighter then. So when I turned 16, I became a junior volunteer. Um, about six months of that became the junior fire chief and really started loving the fire service. And um, uh, my first engine, I always tell it was a 58 C Graves. And, and interestingly, that's a cool story too. I actually took the basic volunteer fire course when I was 17, which you had to be 17 to take it. And the instructor a gentleman named John Romero from the Florida State Fire College. And he was a retired captain from Tampa. That was his engine when he was a captain. He told us all the stories about it. Big old 12 cylinder engine. So I got to learn to drive a fire engine that was an unsynchronized gear shift. And, and so I, you know, that's where I fell in my love for old fire engines. Um, I had enough credits to graduate from high school about a semester early, so I enrolled in standards. I turned 18 the night uh, standards class started here at Lake Tech. I was in the first class they ever had, 240 hours back then, and went on to become an instructor there years down, and then, um, I've been a keynote speaker at several of their graduations, and in a couple of years, I was asked to be the director and was already working in St. Cloud, so I had to turn that down, but I left 
high school and then and then uh, swore in the United States Air Force. I was a firefighter in the Air Force, both structural and crash rescue. Uh, I was at Andrews Air Force Base, so I got to spend a lot of time seeing Air Force One and Marine One and different heads of state come in and out of Andrews Air Force Base. So that was an interesting part of my career. Um, I actually worked in our alarm center, so I have some comm center experience. And I did that so I could go to EMT school. So I got my EMT at Maryland Fire Rescue Institute. And um, so I kept that. And then I, I transitioned from the Air Force active duty to reserve, went to work for the city of Deland. And that's significant because back back in the um, mid 80s, I uh, worked for city. Now they had a requirement had to be a smoke diver within a year. So I am a certified smoke diver also. Um, that was a tough class. Uh, I think I still hurt from that, and that was over 40 years ago. So um, went to paramedic school. City of Deland sent me to paramedic school. I worked for EVAC Ambulance for a couple of years, um, both as an EMT and as a paramedic, and then went to work for Orange County Fire Rescue. City of Deland decided not to have an ALS service, and so I felt like I spent a year and a half in school, and I needed to go, go on and, and uh had a great career at Orange County. I, I was a firefighter paramedic, started on Rescue 30, which was one of the busiest rescues in the county. Um, interestingly, my my preceptor, Ed Williams, passed away this morning. I just oh, got notified wow. of that. Very sad um, time for me, but uh, he was a great guy and great preceptor. I was a chase medic. I worked on the squad. Um, ended up um, becoming a company officer on the squad. And then uh, did that for a couple of years and they started the safety officer program. So I was very interested in firefighter safety, Chief Brandt. Uh, I was his EMS supervisor and we used to run the, the battalion management team concept and I was his safety officer. And uh, we started expanding that program and uh, did that for a couple of years. Then I became a battalion chief. And I, I always remember the interview. I went in and Chief Plogger and Chief Fitzgerald and I think Chief Lyon were there and Chief Plogger asked me, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be the chief of special ops, you know, my background in special ops, he goes, no. And I said, okay. I said, what about uh, chief of training? I said that, you know, I have a training background. I love to teach. I teach at the Votech. No, no, we got a new position. I said, okay, tell me about it. It's called executive battalion chief. You will be my aide and you'll be in charge of accreditation. I go, hmm, this sounds interesting. So I actually ended up voluntold to become the executive battalion chief. Um, two major projects I didn't work on. Um, during that period of my career was the accreditation process. Orange County Fire Rescue was the sixth largest agency in the world to become internationally accredited. And that was, you know, I say me, but there was a team of people that did that. And that's one of my first lessons I learned um, about upper level teamwork with managers. So I had a chief, a deputy chief and six division chiefs. I had to corral into completing all those self-assessments and core competencies. And we were able to do that in a couple of years. And we received our accreditation during our 25th anniversary of Orange County becoming a district. And then uh, I was riding around with Chief Plogger one day on our Friday afternoon visits. And he said, hey, I, I looked at your resume. I said, you have a training background. I said, yeah. He said, I want you to get out of the training division. And you know, uh, one of the chiefs had just left. And I said, OK, I'll give it a shot. And I went down there. and. I think I was an acting assistant chief of training and I was did that for a year and then he promoted me to division chief of training. Um, again, I uh, had a great staff in training and, and our, our, our station patch was a groundhog because we did the same thing over and over again. We used to laugh about it being groundhog day. But we did some innovative things during the training division. You know, we did all the training, command school, and then we did the back to the basic program, which I thought was a huge hit. You know, I, I really am a big advocate of fundamentals. And that goes from the, the craft of being a firefighter and a paramedic or an EMT and also from a leadership perspective, get back to your, to your basics and, and how you do that. Um, so I was with Orange County 24 <laughs> years, um, retired in 2010. And I took a year off and I, and I wanted to go back and I finished my master's in public administration and I didn't, really didn't know what I wanted to do. I liked teaching. So I taught at Seminole State, uh, ended up you know, like every other firefighter, I have a part-time job, which I work for Hot Zone USA, and I taught hazmat, confined space, and safety, and uh, ended up going to OUC as a safety coordinator, worked for them for about 14 months, was on a safety inspection down at OUC because they run the electric utility for St. Cloud, city of St. Cloud, and uh, ran into a couple of firefighters out there in the parking lot. They're training buildings right next to OUC building, and I told them who I was, and they're like, oh, our assistant chief's leaving, and I'm sitting around OUC 
been there about 14 months, been a little bored. It was a really good job, treated really well. Um, so I got a little bored and I said, well, maybe I'll get back in the fire service. So I applied for the assistant chief's job and got that. And uh, six months later, the fire chief retired and I was asked by the city manager to become the fire chief. Um, I learned a lot about departments and that goes back to my background in accreditation. I know how to dissect a, a fire department and I use that model to, to really improve uh, St. Cloud Fire Rescue. Um, when I got there, they had two person engine companies, two on the engine, two on the rescue. Uh, we got a safer grant. We bumped everybody up to three, replaced all their equipment. We leased fire trucks. We bought SCBA. The city manager totally supported what I was doing. I came up with a great operational plan. And again, it was about the team. You know, I'll provide the vision and the resources and you guys make it happen. And uh, I used to tell them, you know, we'd have meetings at the train building. All three stations would come. And I said, you know, one day, you know, I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you. I'm going to teach you to train. And then in 2020, they, that training paid off when they rescued six uh, young lives in a uh, heavy fire conditions, uh, oxygen bottles exploding, three, or I'm sorry, six um, disabled children, some of them on vents. And they went into the building on vent and research and, and rescued all of them. And they interviewed one of the female firefighters. And she said, he said the reporter goes, well, what were you thinking about? I went through the winning and she said, my training. That was what, and I was city manager, so it really rubbed me the right way. It's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So the other thing, St. Cloud just became a state certified training facility um, back in December. Wow. Um, so that was one of my visions is to have them have their five-story tower, burn building, and all the props. And we, we put that together. And the reason we did that is we were training down at Central Florida Fire Academy, and it's a 45-minute drive each way. So if I send an engine and rescue down there, I just lost one-third of my my resources. So I convinced the city that that was the right way to go. And now they're contracted with first response training group to provide standards there. So it's a good thing. So four and a half years into the fire chief role, um, doing some really cool things there and really building the organization up and, and building a team. Um, we've been through, Dave, I think it was three or four city managers in a two year period. Wow. So the mayor stands me up at a public meeting and says, will you be the interim city manager? I'm like, sure. So I went into that with uh, blinders on. I didn't know what it would entail. But I went in with the mindset of I'm going to be the city manager, not like permanently, but I'm going to act like it while I'm in there. I'm not just here to sign your paycheck or sign, you know, procurement items. So I went in and I did a SWOT analysis. I developed a strategic plan. And we were sitting in a meeting with Moody's bond rating agency, and they said, we're going to downgrade your bond for political instability. And the mayor's like, okay, well, what do we got to do? He said, to stop that. And he goes, you need a city manager. You need to keep them for five years, and we can get the bond rating up. So the bond rating actually went up twice while I was city manager. Um, so that night, I got appointed city manager. And uh, the first two years were tough. It's a, a politically charged environment, especially in a smaller city who's rapidly growing. Um, people have their own political agendas. Um, but the city manager is the chief executive. And so I had to stand my ground a couple of times both publicly and privately with elected officials. And they have a role. I get that. Um, but I learned a lot about people and dealing with people from you know, high level directors to elected officials to county commissioners and county managers and people on different wavelengths and it just uh, and citizens. We have disgruntled citizens. I dealt with them. So it was a heck of an education. Um, but I got vested last August and I decided that it was time for me to to look at other opportunities. And, and Dr. Knight had contacted me in the summer and asked if I was interested in coming on as a full-time consultant, senior associate with, with Fitch. And so that's where I'm at now. And I've got an education, I can tell you, um, great fire departments across the country, but we have some of the best here in Central Florida. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that, kind of partial. Uh, just my background in education, I have a, um, Master's in Public Administration, a Bachelor's in Occupational Safety and Health, and an AS in Fire Science from the Community College of the Air Force. I'm a certified public manager. And I'm also, um, it's something really hard to get, I'm a credentialed city manager, which took a couple of years working at that, um, which is a big deal in the city manager world. Um, would I go back to it? Mm, probably not. I really like what I'm doing now, and I, I get a lot of free time, and I travel a lot, but it's uh, it's interesting to, to get to help different organizations across the country so in your in your consulting role right now are you 
assisting fire departments in becoming uh, accredited? Is that? Yeah. Right? So, so that's where I met Dr. Knight, Dr. Knight and went to EFO. And then when we got accredited in Orange County, um, you have to give so many people to an accreditation team because what one of the rules of accreditation, you can't go on an accreditation visit in your same state. So I actually went to Montgomery County, Maryland with him, which I had a background in Maryland, and I became one of his team members and I went on a couple of site visits with him. And so we hit it off and he, he liked the way I do things. He used to say, and I'm a very process oriented person and he's a high level analyst. And so I kind of, we kind of ground each other that way. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting um, challenge for me because I'm not an analytic. I told you about, I'm not a mathematician. We do a lot of data crunching. But we have analysts. They all have PhDs that do that. And I, but once I know it's right, I can stand up in front of an elected body and tell them this is what your issue is and this is how we think you should fix it. So I actually joke around. I said, what do you do? I said, I do insulting, not consulting. <laughs> some people, you can rub them the wrong way a little bit. But you know, some of it's always in good fun. Um, and we work with everybody. We actually have contracts with labor organizations. We stand in their corner sometimes and then we stand against them sometimes. And so it's kind of a, a fun walk and it's it's always been nice for me to be well respected by labor because I was always fair and consistent and that's what they look for we want somebody that's fair and consistent yeah so yeah, I'm I'm really curious about I mean this is the first time that I've interviewed uh, a chief officer that you know has <clears throat> well one you You've got a master's degree. You've got your executive fire officer, which is essentially another master's degree. And then being credentialed as a city manager and then having that role for a period of time that, you know, navigating those waters, I'm sure there's some parallels with city manager and fire chief. Um, and, and I was wondering if you could maybe explore that with me and, I don't know, uh, share some of your your lessons learned in both of those roles. Sure, absolutely. So the first thing that I learned um, in both roles is the importance of leadership. And that's your responsibility to provide a vision. And then, the so there's a definition I like to use from a book called Leader Metrics, and it's called The Ability to Inspire and the capacity to serve. You hear the word servant leader kicked around a lot, but if you're not humble and have humility, you're not a servant leader. That's a word you're using. So I learned the importance of communication. And like I told you earlier, I was talking about, I had to deal with people as a city manager, elected officials, not just the community's elected officials, but the county commissioners. I've been in Governor um, DeSantis's office, I've been in Senator Rick Scott's, Senator Marco Rubio, and you talk to them, you know, some of their people, but your communication skills have to be, because they don't have a lot of time, they have to be clear and concise. What are you asking for? But you also, and I learned this during the accreditation, I, I still remember, I was riding around, he was a deputy chief of Richmond, and I, I wish I could recall his name, and I said, talk to me about leadership. What's the most important leadership lesson you could tell me right now? And he goes, listen to your people. So I've made a staple out of it. I listen to people. Does that mean I agree with everything they say? No. But I do listen to them because they want to be part of something bigger than them. And I also encourage dissent. Now, I used to say as both a fire chief and a city manager, I said, come in here and close the door. You can call me names. You can disagree with me. I want you to tell me why you disagree. But when you walk out that door, I've made the decision. I expect you to carry the water. And that always worked really well for me. And so, so leadership is about adaptability, about the, the situ it's situational. You can't have one leadership style. It has to be different ones based on personality, project. Um, uh, you know, we deal with multi-generational, multicultural teams now. So you have to be very cognizant of the environment and and I go back and I look at my background. In fact, I, I just got asked to speak at Nona Leadership, which I'm going to get me on that, that. I'll get you down there one day. Um, and I'm going to talk about, and one of the things I love doing is after action reviews. And I use the Blue Angels Blue Line debrief. We started that at St. Cloud. And I've done after action reviews. I've done critiques for other organizations that asked to come and do it. 
but I'm going to do a critique of my life and an after action review and the things I learned from a leadership perspective. But the most important thing I learned growing up, and like I said, from my mother, the heart of a teacher, the logic of an engineer, but it was the culture I learned. I went to an international school in Shiraz, Iran, with people from all over the world. I lived in Thailand with Thai. I went to the Thai Catholic school and I didn't speak Thai. Well, until I left there, I did. But I think that environment taught me the importance of respecting different cultures and different thought processes. And these people were, were Buddhist, you know, and Muslims. And, you know, some we played soccer together. We played cricket together. You know, hear me saying football, so, so baseball. You hear me talking hockey. They didn't have that. But but we were just kids, you know, and we and I learned so much about different cultures. Um, and then, you know, go back a little further. My background, I learned the importance of being a volunteer. And so, you know, I still volunteer. My time, I'm a, I'm a mentor for the Florida Youth Challenge Academy. And it's for at-risk youth. And it's run by the National Guard. And they, they put them in a boot camp scenario for six months. And then a year after, I'm, I had mentored them through that program. And then for a year or so. I learned as a volunteer, you got to keep giving back. Um, and then, you know, with Orange County, I learned the importance of being flexible because it was a large organization and things change quickly. You know that you get an IB or a geo every other week and you just learn the flexibility. But then when I became a fire chief in a department that was struggling, I figured out very quickly I couldn't do it by myself. And I carried that mindset to the city manager's office. So I've always had this innate ability to put the right people on the seat in the seats on the bus. I can drive the bus sometimes, but get the right people, pick the right people, and you don't have issues. And you know, people throw the word about accountability. Oh, we got to hold people accountable. I said, no, you guys hold each other accountable. You know. Um, Lissoni, Lincioni talks about that all the time, about how you hold somebody accountable, how the team needs to hold each other accountable. Um, so, but yeah, it just, you know, leadership is adaptive. You have to provide vision. You have to have good communication skills and you have to be a good listener. And that's like not listening to respond, but really trying to find out what the message is. And I can tell you this, Dave, I'd have people that struggle and they have issues and every time there was some kind of conflict, it never had anything to do with the job. It was always something personal in their background or something that happened to them. They got in a fight with a wife, got in a fight with a husband, the boyfriend, the significant other, whoever, and or, or something else was going on in their life. And, you know, I was good at drilling down into that, you know, and it gave them that safe space to come in and talk to me about that and shut the door. With that rule of, hey, if you disagree, even at a staff meeting, I, I was sitting there with 12 directors, you know, you disagree with me, I want to hear it. And I want to know why, you know, you deserve, I deserve to tell you why I made the decision. You just should tell me why you disagree. And when you do that, you always come up with the best product. And again, government service is about, you work for the people. You're there to be good stewards of their money and do things efficiently and effectively. And, you know, I used to say that all the time and it just worked really well for me. In your role as a chief officer and city manager, were there times that you had made a decision like this is this is the way we're going to do this and then have a conversation with somebody where you listen to their perspective and what they thought and you actually change your mind? And then if so, how did you do that without losing face? Well, I think it's about building trust. And I think that that relationship of, and I say allowing, but demanding dissent builds that trust because it's not about me. It's about the mission and trying to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So if, and I did that many times, I made a decision and because remember that majority of my career in public safety, I had to make decisions and you did too, as a chief officer with very limited information, but we were expected to make a decision in a critical environment rapidly. When I became a city manager, I figured I couldn't do that anymore. I had to sit back and be more pragmatic. Many times I made decisions and then I get a little bit more information and I would call the person up and say, hey, I made that decision the other day, but I've got more information. And it ends up, you were right. And I appreciate you bringing that forward. 
Uh, and so if we're authentic with somebody and we're truthful with them, and then sometimes, you know, I, I've made decisions I was totally wrong and they felt like I was out of integrity with them. I would sit down with them. I'd go to their office and say, I'm here to get back an in integrity with you. They look at me really funny and I'd say, I made a mistake. It was a poor decision. Maybe the way I said it to you was inappropriate. I said, I never, I never cussed or yelled at anybody, but you know, you get upset and you make a decision, but I always owned it. I always owned it. And that goes in my personal life too, with my spouse, with my kids. I've made decisions that affected them. They didn't like it, but I own it every time. You brought up the the back to the basics training that we did. And I remember, you know, I was a lieutenant at that time. And, you know, Derek Alligood came out. He was one of the people that you employed to roll that program out. Him and uh, Arrowwood, um, two two legends in Orange County, you know. Yeah. And, um, I'm curious, like, the, the thought process and maybe the chain of events that led to the development of that, because it was amazing. Like, there wasn't, a person on the department, you know, what, a thousand, 1100 strong that, that did not appreciate the work that went into developing that program and then how it was rolled out. Yeah. Everybody gains uh, something from it. Well, if you recall, I, I am big on crew resource management for the fire service. And one of those fundamentals is training and I always tell this story, and you, know, you know, I'm an avid golfer. I played at high amateur level, not as good as Nick Cannis, though, but, or Mike Miller, but close. Um, and so, you know, you take some of your lessons from other things you do in your life. So I was playing golf. I was actually at reserve duty in the Air Force. And I was playing with a gentleman who was a firefighter, but he'd also been a major league baseball player. And he, I think he was minors. He was a pitcher. And I said, well, I was playing really bad. I'm, like, I'm hitting the ball on the golf course. I go, when you were a pitcher, and you started pitching bad. What did you do? He goes, I went back to my fundamentals. So that always was in my mind when I, when, and then we had some drills at Orange County that didn't go so well. And if you remember when I became training chief, I came from, you know, working at, at Hot Zone USA. Uh, we had those mobile training props for Hazmat and Fine Space. I was like, hmm, we could do that in Orange County because we have 880 square miles we have to cover. So we set up the training tower you know, offsite at a, at a wastewater plant or so we started doing that. And I just saw some things, the complacency. And I always, I always want to preface this. When I say complacency, it doesn't mean you're lazy. You just get comfortable. And I love taking some of these uncomfortable, making them uncomfortable. And so I saw a couple of drills that were just abysmal. And I said that, and I told the captains, I told the training lieutenants, that's not going to happen anymore, but let's start with the basics. So I, we started, we had a meeting and I said, okay, who are the most respected training people in Orange County? And we started listing off names and we started contacting them like John Haskett, Richie Arrowwood, you know, and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And so we brought them in, put, and they actually were glad to come and work on days for six months. They loved it. They came in, they put the program together. I had brought Steve Kidd back in who has done videos and curriculum development. And so we brought him back from retirement. And I think it started off, if you remember correctly, we, we put together the program, basic hose line, ladder, forcible entry. Who was the first group that went through that? Do you recall? All the chief officers. Uh. Leadership by example. I said, that's the first step in this. All of our chiefs from the fire chief to the newest battalion chief need to go through this. And we did, and we videotaped it, we photographed it. And everybody's like, wow, the chiefs can do that. That's pretty cool. So that was a huge success. It really put the, the um, emphasis on training. And, and it's not about the advanced training. We get so hung up on the special ops and the different kinds of things we do, the all hazards. But you know something? At the end of the day, the most dangerous thing we do is fight fire. <laughs> Um, and then if you recall, we did that. And then UCF, uh, one of the uh, fraternities gave us, I want to say it was like 16 buildings to burn at, uh, out by UCF. And we put together Survival City and we did that for four months. We did 156 live fires 
with no injuries, other than I think Rick Gunner scraped his um, shins with some drywall one time, but no significant, you know, nothing like injuries. But we did, you know, thermal imaging, uh, rescue, and then we did, ended up with a, a, a live burn uh, two or three at the end of the day. And uh, and that was all based on basic. It was nothing advanced, nothing crazy. Um, and it really engaged people in, in the training process. And then obviously we got their feedback. And, and I, I still think Orange County's got one of the best training uh, cadres of instructors and facility and the training programs are some of the best in the country. It was pretty awesome. You know, and I, you know, I like talking about those guys, John Haskett, Rich Airwood and, and Derek Alligood. Yeah. Uh, I got a story about Derek in my book and uh, you know, it was his last shift and we had a, an apartment fire. Um, he had done a mutual where he he left 83, uh, took a floating lieutenant position uh, so that his, uh, you know, he was on truck 83 forever and his engineer had gotten promoted. Well, he went and he was a floating lieutenant. Well, when it was time for Derek to uh, retire, they did a mutual and that was one of those guys that he would work at the busiest firehouse. Uh, and you, you remember how busy station 63 was. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where he was for his last shift <laughs> and got an apartment fire. Uh, it was a pretty bad lightning storm. Lightning had struck this apartment building and uh, the fire got running in the, in the attic space. Um, they went, when they arrived on scene, there was, there was fire venting from the, the gable end of the roof. And, um, he went to work. There was issues with the pump. Uh, I got there. I was the second battalion chief there. I was made, um, division three, went up to the third floor communications. It, it was like all these things were happening where it was, it was like something bad is going to happen if we don't get this stuff under control. And then uh, elevated master stream was opened up and um, there were still people on the third floor and Derek had, or Lieutenant Alley good had started down the breezeway to an apartment. He had sent a couple of, of firefighters into to do a search. So he wanted to make sure that they had gone down. And as he's walking down that breezeway, the roof came in. Um, it actually hit him. But, you know, when when that happens, it's like pitch black. And then maybe like an orange glow. And I thought I just watched one of my best friends die. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, all it did was hit him and knock him to his knees. And he made his way down <laughs> the other yeah, stairwell I, I did not know that that's that's probably after i retired but yeah i'm glad you know what what a good dude i actually brought him down to st cloud to sit down with my company officers one time and just just chew the fat with him for and i called it a class but they they learned so much from him and asked me to come back a couple of times so um just salty their company officer and you know i i always tell people this as a fire chief as a battalion division chief the backbone of the fire service is the company officer and interestingly i can ride down the road and get behind a fire truck and tell you if the hose is loaded with pride i got a good company officer sitting up there if it's all over the place and they're just the truck's dirty you don't have a good company officer sitting up there it's not happening it's it sounds stupid but it's like it's not happening Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could just tell in minutes, like, wow. Well, I walk into a fire station somewhere, the pride and ownership, the leadership, I can see it right away. I can feel it. Um, and I want to go back to something you said about all those chain of events. And you know, I have a background in safety to all those chain of events. And you just knew something was going wrong. You know, pilots call that looking for ghosts. If they start seeing all these things starting to miss happen, the aircraft, something's getting ready to happen. And so you were right, that that looking for ghosts, that intuition, that gut, 
you know, and, and they teach you to listen to it. And so, you know, I'm glad that he didn't, but, you know, I want to tell people, you got to listen to your gut. And that's why it was so important that we put people in that command simulator and gave them that slide tray of, of, of experience. So, so what the brain does when it sees a problem, it tries to optimize the problem. So if you've never seen that problem, it doesn't know where to go. And that's why you get people get tunnel vision. They start losing focus, um, making poor command decisions. But that that simulator teaches people to make that decision-making process. So if something's not going right, you know when to stop. And that's why, you know, it, it was fun to put people under pressure, but it taught them how to make decisions under pressure. I don't know where or who was responsible. Was that Chief Godfrey? Was... Yeah, it was Bill, Chief Bill Godfrey. He was the one that was kind of the person that had that vision. And and um, he's moved on. He does actor shooter training, same thing, simulation all over the country now. But yeah, that was his vision. And, um, you know, I bought into it. I love doing, I love teaching. I, I like playing with simulation. Um, and when I was training chief that was my fourth year EFO paper was decision making um under stress and I went out and visited the Institute of Simulation and Training at UCF and I don't remember the doctor's name and I said hey how about this how about that so the simulator that's at Valencia now the immersive simulator was my fourth year EFO paper what I learned in that Dave was it's not about the simulator it's the curriculum leading up to it just like so I, the, the gentleman I worked to Colonel Ron Tarr with the Raptor group at UCF, he actually rewrote Army basic training back in the 80s. And he told me, he said, okay, well, you like planes and all, yeah. And he says, well, you don't go from not knowing how to fly to a 747, right? We got to put you into a Cessna, then a twin engine, a small jet. And I, I go, ah, I got it. So we need to do the same thing with the simulations. That's why you do the computer-based training. And then we used to call it the Kobayashi Maru from Star Trek was the simulator at the end. So, Well, and then even with the simulator, we would start off with, you know, a single family dwelling and gradually work our way up to a large right. uh, structure, uh, multifamily dwelling or a box store or something like that. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, that uh, crawl, walk, run. Yeah, exactly what it is. It's, it's you know, uh, there's a methodology and, and sometimes we lose track of that. Again, it's fundamentals. We, we started off with the fundamental, we'll call it bread and butter house fire, which is the one that's going to get you killed faster than anything. Because, you know, everybody's an alert on the big box store. We got heavy fire showing. It's the house fire that gets us. You know, we, we let our guard down a little bit. Now, you had mentioned something when you were talking about after action reviews. and I, I'd never heard that the the Blue Angels had their own. They do. Uh, can you can you explain yeah. that? So so again, and, and I'll tell you the story behind that too, so people remember it. So my best friend growing up um, became a naval aviator. Went to Annapolis when I was at Andrews Air Force Base. He was at Annapolis, so we got to see each other. Um, unfortunately, in two thousand nine, he was the executive officer at Fallon Naval Air Station. He was over the Top Gun program. And he had went on Memorial Day weekend to pick, I don't know if you remember this story, his, um, in his personal plane, picked up him and his three daughters, and they um, crashed on final, coming back from Modesto, California, um, and it killed all four of them. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Blue Angels were going to fly at Fallon that weekend, so they put his name and the kids' names on the plane, and I was at Nash Park, it was my fourth year EFO, it was my last week of EFO. I saw it. I was at my brother's house. He lived a couple hours outside of Emmitsburg. I saw it on the ticker tape for Fox News, and then I was just devastated. I called my mother. I called his mother, and I said, I will be there. And so I told them I got to leave, you know, and they did graduate me two days early. I flew out to Fallon, to Reno, and they introduced me to the Blue Angels, you know, that weekend. They they stayed for the, the, the ceremony and stuff. And um, but then I got VIP later on that year. Because his um, his maintenance officer, when he was on the Nimitz, was a Blue Angel. He was he was a maintenance. Matter of fact, I have his flight suit right here. Um, so I started studying them. You know what what do they do differently? Why are they so good at what they do? So there's some things they do. They have to have a special FAA um, waiver because they they don't fly with G suits. They have to do different maneuvers and stuff like that. 
they have a 40 pound false feel in their stick because they don't they fly so close together but they do this every before they fly and after they fly they do a pre-brief where they chair fly the entire show they close their eyes they say turning left now and they critique that at the end of, so they spend more time on the critique than a 45 hour 40 minute their critiques an hour and a half to two hours for a 45 minute show and it starts off there's no rank there's no personalities and it's a blue line debrief they call it. you leave all that stuff at the door and they start off with the the number one they call him boss starts off and he said I'm going to call a safety on myself. I was 30 feet low in the breakout loop. And I said, I'll fix my safeties. Glad to be here. And he'll start off. So he said, I'm glad to be here. I'm just another naval aviator. Got the privilege to be the angel. I screwed up today. It's not going to happen again. And they go around the room. They look at video. The flight surgeon's actually rating them. They have a scoring sheet. And we would never know that standing on the ground because it looks so cool. But they're like off by timing by seconds. They're they're calling each other on seconds and they tell them, hey, four, you're a little high, you're a little fast, you're a little slow. And they always end up, it's never personal. And so I started that at, at St. Cloud because it was a department that a lot of cannibalism, because there'd been a leadership vacuum. And I said, okay, first thing, there's no personality. We wouldn't even say it'd be like firefighter from engine 32. We didn't use her name, firefighter engine 32, who you know, you, you stress the line in the wrong area of the building, you know, something like that. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I'll make sure I do my, and then we would go through that process. So the first thing you would, and there's a process you do, what are the facts? So you go through the whole incident. We listen to the radio calls. We read the transcript. And then we'd say, okay, what do we do really good? Here's all the things we did good. Okay. What do we do really bad and how are we going to improve it? And we'd come up with these one page after action reviews and it'd go out as a training bulletin. And the company officers would sit down with the other crews. And I trained a couple of the lieutenants to do these after action reviews. And so I didn't have to do them anymore. I love doing them, but I was like, well, they're not going to learn if I keep doing them. And it just turned into this. And we build training off of that. We reenact that fire. You know, we'd simulate it at the burn building or at the tower. And they just started, they just got better. We actually videotaped training too. A lot of people are like, well, you know, they're going to get sued. I'm like, no, it's work product. It's quality assurance. And we would videotape, we'd review the video. We'd spend more time, like I said, reviewing the video and say, okay, well, you know, we'd go everything from their on-scene report to extinguishing the fire. You know, we just go through the whole process. And they do that too. They even critique, the Blue Angels critique each other marching out to the planes. You know, you're out of step, you're this, you're that. I mean, it's so, and then the maintenance crew, crew does the same thing. They're on each other too, but it's never personal. And that's the thing, because I, I was like, when I would go to critiques, Dave, and I'd facilitate him, and I did a few at Orange County, I would be sitting there in a critique going, well, I wasn't at that call. It was a total, you know, goat rope. Or everybody's patting everybody on the back. You know, like I said, it's, it's a total goat rope. Or everybody gets in a fist fight. And I'm like, that's not going to solve the problem. So I started looking for ways. How do we make these critiques better? And I've been asked by the Forest Service to come in and do some critiques, too, because they found out I did that. And I also do a little drill. Um, it's real simple. I give them a tennis ball and they pass it around a group of four or five people in a circle and I time them. How many times do you touch the ball? It might be, you know, in a minute, you know, 50, 60 times. And then I give them two balls and then it comes up, you know, 80, 90 times. And I said, well, let's do an after action review. Well, we could do this. We could do that. We could and then pretty soon they get it down to 200 times in the same amount of time because they talked about it. They figured out a better way to do it. So it's so simple, but it, it, you know, it, it, but the biggest thing is it's got to be a process. Um, there's a book called Courage to Execute. It talks about the same thing, but it's how fighter pilots, they again, they spend two hours briefing for a 30 minute flight and then two hours debriefing after the flight. And it's the same thing. They talk about the same kind of thing. And it's so humbling. And it, you, you think you got these high rated, experienced cocky fighter pilots but they are so humbled when they do that they actually see videos of it now they actually let people into the ready room now to videotape when they do these things but they're ultimately focused and again their job is to you know show how great the Na our navy is and our aviation program it, it's so important that we learn from our mistakes before they become critical errors that cost somebody their life um, that includes citizens. I mean, we, we can do things better on the search or, you know, I was not a big advocate of BES until they saved those six kids, 
you know, and I was like, okay, all right. And that was one of those things, situations like I was wrong. I never said no, I didn't like it. You know, I don't like firefighter bailouts either, but, you know, again, we were able to put some safety things in place. Um, when I was president of the Central Florida Fire Academy uh, board, I think we had three people hurt doing bailouts. I was, I was driving home from St. Cloud one day and I still lived up in Lake County and Matt McGrew calls me and he was like, Bill, I just had a guy fall from the tower. I'm like, well, is he okay? First off, I said, what were they doing? Um, bailouts? I said, uh, double loop. What was it? Uh, I'm trying to think of what it, it wasn't a belay. It was a double prusik belay system. And I'm like, well, that's not a fall arrest system. It's different. You're already falling three feet before that thing catches you and that's going to hurt. Um, so we actually found some equipment we used. And so it is a life-saving tactic, but it has to be trained properly. My, my point is, is, you know, even the old man can be wrong and you can prove him wrong. And that it's not about proving, but it's about showing that there's a better way to do something. And I had the lieutenants that had the courage to keep training their crews that way. And it paid off. Because I instilled training in their heart. Right. This this guy, I had a lieutenant down there, and, and like I said, a lot of people didn't care for him. But last year, he got instructor of the year and company officer of the year. He would get up there in the morning and go, he'd walk out there in the bay, pulling his three-quarter hand line right now. <laughs> and they'd be like, well, why are we doing that, LT? Well, because I want you to know how to pull his three-quarter hand line like, right now. <laughs> and he, just, <laughs> he was that kind of guy. He'd be like, middle of the night, we're going to lay a line in this hydrant and hit the system. It's two in the morning. Yeah, I know. It's best time to train. There's nobody out. You know, that kind of stuff. And then it's like, hmm. It, it really, and like I said, those people just grew to respect them. Is there, because we've talked about a, a lot of stuff. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you feel is important to, to leave with the listeners? Um, and second, Throughout your professional career, what are you most proud of? I, I think the first thing that I would tell people and, and want to leave with this is you've got to be well-read. If you want to be a leader, you need to be well-read. And I, and I want to put a caveat to that. Don't come in every week with flavor of the week. Really define your style for the environment you're working in and the organization you're working with. It has to be tailored. Um, and, and that goes hand in hand. My proudest accomplishment is watching people that work with me grow and become chief officers, become city manager. My deputy city manager became the city manager of St. Cloud. She grew under me. And just watch people throughout my career excel. And I know I had a little part of that. Like I said, you know that from your background, you have to dig down deep sometimes and find out who you really are. But there had to be someone in your life that played that mentoring role that you looked up to, that told you something in a meeting, in a class, a family member, a conversation that changed the way you looked at life, professionally and personally. That's my proudest moment is just having a little part in the success of people more so than the organization, because I know the organization doesn't thrive without people. And leaders forget that. I watch people move up and like, they forget where they came from. And when I was fire chief of St. Cloud, I had all my helmets from my whole career behind me. And I've gotten rid of them because they're all black and stuff like that. Now I've got my shield back there on my desk. And I put them where I could see them every day because I never wanted to forget where I came from. When, when Firefighter Smith came in my office and had an issue or Firefighter Smith broke something, like Bill Sturgeon did many times, like the day I wrapped the mirrors around a squad one and a bus on I-4. So, you know, they come in and, a, and, a, and an air tank had fallen out of the compartment. You know, the compartments they have over the wheels came out and destroyed a brand new, you know, Scott SCB, they're, they're a thousand bucks. And the, and the engineer thought he was going to lose his job. I said, well, uh, what happened? The thing came open. So we go back there and the latch is broken. Well, that's not your fault. You know, they're thinking they're going to get fired and all this. So my point is those helmets up there always remind me of where I came from. And then when I was in the city manager's office, I had two 
I had this Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and I still have this picture in my office. Remember the picture from Firestorm with the firefighter and, and Mickey Mouse? Remember yeah. that poster yeah. from uh, when we had the um, the big fires in Florida? I put that in there because I didn't want to forget my fire service back now. Because that's where I came from. Yeah. And I put out a lot of fires as a city manager and never had a hose line in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty much it, Dave. Yeah, that's awesome. I, Chief, I really appreciate you taking the time. I, you know, I look back on my career and, you know, I remember watching you. I don't remember really hearing much of what you said. It was more of how you carried yourself and how the people that you were leading, like your immediate team of people, mm -hmm. how they watched you. And that says everything to me. When you see the people that are being led by an individual and they're like that guy's biggest fans and they're operating a certain way because of that person, it's evident the level of respect. And when some salty firefighters have got a great deal of respect for their boss, that says everything about that guy. And, you know, having this opportunity to talk to you and, and pick your brain, it's been awesome. I know that there's young firefighters out there as well as chief officers that are going to get something out of this conversation. Absolutely. And I just really appreciate you taking the time with me. Yeah. Chief. And it's an honor to be here with you, Dave. I'm proud of you and the, and the, the fire officer you are become and the man you become. I'm just really proud of you. I've always told you that. Um, I've watched you. I've sat back and kind of behind the scenes watching you and I'm really proud of what you're doing. I'm, I want to, um, congratulate you and i want to see you get your phd and and i will ask you one one request when you graduate with that funny hat on your head i want to be there all right cool all right yeah that'd be awesome all right and like i said you want to do it again you know we can we can touch on some other things you know they'll probably it's probably a couple of years i'll probably be bored with this in a couple of minutes but <laughs> <laughs> no but that I, that piece about listening um you know i i've talked about that quite a bit such a vital part of communication and and leadership mm -hmm. and hearing you talk about it um it just makes it that much more clear to me how important it is uh you know being able to see your success your you know in your professional life your personal life and just uh the people that you've surrounded yourself with it's um that's really cool so yes thank you very well, much and again, I will definitely i will definitely invite you sir all right well thank you brother and i'm glad to call you friend also and i've enjoyed this uh this evening and uh, like i said give me a shout sir all right, great thanks, Dave. all right Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review.